Uh, Thanks, James. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, as James is kind enough to, to say, uh, my name is Rod Parker. It's an absolute pleasure to be here today, and uh, you know, I'm a great believer, having had so long in the industry myself, put something back in. Idea of today, it's very much a, you know, it's very relaxed. It's an open forum. You want to stop me at any time or shut me up, ask a question, do you know? So, I think what what we'll look at possibly doing today. I'll give you an overview of, of, of my career and, and what I've been fortunate enough to, to do over the last 40 years, um, and then maybe have a quick break, and then we'll, we'll go into maybe what I consider, but maybe more importantly, what the industry considers is, is, is required at the moment to succeed, or certainly you know, to get into the industry and go from there. And then you know, we'll have a, more of a, a general uh, question uh, session at the end of that. But as I say, anytime you want to stop me, ask a question, uh, please feel free. Um, yeah, Rod Park, I was born here in Melbourne, um, grew up in Noble Park to the age of nine and then lived in Mildura and that's where I learned to fly in Mildura. I started flying in 1979, probably most of you weren't born then but I uh, won't go into that. Uh, I was very fortunate, um, I was at that age, had a tiny bit of money in the bank uh, and I made an inquiry at the local flying school, how do I, how do I get a pilot's licence, what do I do? And, the response was 40 hours, $40 an hour. And I thought, right, I could do that. I'll be a pilot. Well, many decades later, you know, obviously the, the education, the learning continues. And that, that was then called a restricted pilot's license. It's effectively an RPL, which is possibly what you got or aiming for at the moment. Uh, so I, like, like you, I did it as a modular route. Um, I, I, I'd go work and do, and do a do a job at a supermarket or a farm or the council or whatever to save up some money to do that the, the next rating, the next endorsement. So the next few years um, I, uh, I continued down that path, you know, CPL subjects I did just down the road here in 1981, 82 went and did a twin rating, commercial license after that. And that was all done at Mildura with my flying, uh, flying instructor uh, back there. 1983 I did a, an instrument rating, 1984 I did my ATPL subjects. Um, I'm not saying that's the way to do it. I appreciate there's obviously a lot of instructors here. I had a lot of colleagues at that stage um, who, instead of doing the instrument rating, went and went did the instructor's rating and, and then uh, took that path, then got the class one instrument rating, or the instrument rating as it's now called, then went and got the subjects. Um, so that, that, that's how I progressed on a modular route through those years. The early 80s were pretty tough years um, uh, for the economy. Uh, so I struggled to get a full-time job. So in the meantime, I, I did parachute dropping, I, I did joy flights, I did bushfire spotting and a Piper Tomahawk, if any of you know that little two-seater, which scared the living daylights out of me doing that at night time. Um, uh, you know, I'd, I'd go on aero club trips away, anything to, to get the hours up and stay current. And just a word I'll, I'll use a lot today, I persevered. You know, perseverance in this industry is so, so important. So it's one thing when I spoke at Box Hill a month or two ago, I gave a mini version of this. And, you know, there's three things in aviation, it's perseverance, perseverance and perseverance. And hopefully that message will come across and what I've, I've had to do in my career and the things that have happened to me. And it's hard work. It really is at times, it's really hard work. But you know, if you, if you do persevere, it will pay off. And it, you know, it's a great industry to be involved in. There's, there's, excuse the pun, but there, there are a lot of highs that are associated with the industry and lots of different options too as, as to what you want to do. So we'll come back to the options as we go along. Uh, so to continue on timeline, 1985, I first full-time job uh, as a first officer, a co-pilot uh, for Kendall Airlines, which is now Rex Aviation, um, based here in Melbourne. I started as a Metroliner first officer. Very quickly after that, the company grew very quickly. So I then became a Saab 340 first officer the following year and I flew both types. Uh, I, was, I was in Kendall's for two and a half years. It was tough work. The only time I think uh, Mr. Kendall ever spoke to me was to tell me off. I was a junior co-pilot, but uh, it was a great experience. Metro liners, the autopilots didn't work. So we would do eight sectors a day, no autopilot, no flight director, raw, uh, raw data, right-hand side of the copa. It was hard work, but boy, it was a great experience. You know, So great experience to hone. Um, the instrument flying, and I'd never flown right seat before too. So for those of you instructors, you know, or my mates who are instructors, I was very jealous because I was tending to do this a bit from the right seat. But um, so uh, yeah, on to the Saab 340 a few months later, and complete difference to the Metroliner. Uh, Ethos 
which I, was pretty modern in my time, but television screens, auto parts, flight directors, and a flight attendant as well. So I'd really gone up to the big time on the Saab. Um, did that for two and a bit years, fortunate enough in 1988 to join Ansett Airlines, which is my dream job. And uh, I thought, oh, my perseverance has paid off. I've got a job at Ansett, I'm set for life. I joined Ansett and I can remember they sent me a letter saying, you know, congratulations, uh, you worked till the age of 60, here's your retirement date. And I thought, oh, that's it. I can sit back and relax. Well, you probably all know your aviation history, but 1989, we had a bit of a, a, an airline dispute and myself, like hundreds of other uh, pilots, um, end of 89, found ourselves out of work. So I was very keen to continue my career. Fortunately, I had British grandparents. Uh, so in early 1990, I, I went overseas. Initially, I picked up a short-term contract with Aer Lingus, obviously based in Ireland, based in Dublin, um, on the Fokker 50. Sorry, I should have said in answer. I, I joined as a Fokker 50 first officer, flew that for about a year, went on to the A320, the A320 then was a brand new aeroplane. It was the most amazing aeroplane um, in, in the skies. Fly by wine, a civilian aircraft was unheard of. It wasn't very popular, so being a very junior first officer, because no one else wanted to fly it, I was able to get onto it as, as a first officer. And I flew it for a very small amount of time. Um, anyhow, the dispute happened in 89, overseas 1990. You flew for Aer Lingus back on the Fokker 50 uh, for one year until the Gulf War, the first Gulf War into 1990 started. Uh, myself and my colleagues got laid off, we were contractors. 91 ac across uh, the, the Irish Sea and um, started living in the United Kingdom. And this is where the perseverance comes in again. I had to start my career again. I had an Australian AT Pell, a couple of thousand hours, but uh, you know, I, I chose to, to live and work in Britain. And so I had to go do the British AT Pell. So I had to do all my, my CPL technical subjects again, and my AT Pell subjects, and my instrument rating. Uh, and also open up my license on, on a, a small type. So that was hard work. I was working at a pub in Nottingham. I was earning nearly three pound an hour and the, the twin was costing 300 pound an hour to hire. So it was, um, yeah, it was hard work. It was hard work. But that took me a year to convert my Australian ATPL to a British ATPL. I was very fortunate. I, I got through it. 1992, a local company in East Midlands Airport, Central England, uh, those of you maybe know the UK a bit, um, uh, were recruiting A320 pilots. I'd flown it a little bit with ANSET and I was fortunate enough to, to get a job with a company there, a charter company called Excalibur, uh, flying the A320s. And when I flew the A320s for ANSET, they had 144 seats, two class aeroplanes, domestic flights only. Uh, Excalibur had exactly the same aeroplane, A320-200. 180 seats on board, which is now standard, but uh, in those, those days was unusual, it was very high density, and we flew it all through Europe. So I went as far north as the Arctic Circle, um, this time we up to Rovaniemi for the, uh, uh, the Father Christmas flights, we took the aeroplane as far south as Kenya uh, as well. So amazing amount of flying. Majority of the flying was in Spain, uh, Italy, uh, Greece and Turkey, holiday destinations, where the Brits want to go on holidays. Weather's not great in the UK, although this summer was amazing, but generally the summers are lousy. They, they want to get out of the UK and go somewhere warm. So uh, it was, again, incredible flying. I probably went to 50 or 60 airports through Europe on this A320, so amazing experience. And for, you know, for a domestic airline pilot here in Australia to fly the same aeroplane in Europe, and you know, what a different experience, what a really different world. Um, also learn how to fly LVO, which is low vis operations approach, as the aeroplane could auto land, and uh, we could land the aeroplane in zero feet, decision height and 75 metres visibility, something which just wasn't available here. It's only just come here to Australia now, but 30 years ago it was unheard of. So terrific experience doing that. Um, UK weather's not great either. So, you know, again, I think we're spoiled here with our weather generally, uh, flying in Europe, uh, and that was, was another good experience. Fortunate enough, I, I, was, I, I became a captain on the A320, so I was very, very fortunate at you know, a young age to be, be an A320 captain, and the learning continued then, you know, swapping seats and, and, and doing that. Uh, the company then got in financial trouble, seemed to have a habit of joining the wrong companies, and uh, they contracted. And while I kept my job, I was demoted back to a first officer, but they, they traded in the A320s for a DC-10, which I'm not sure many of you know, but it was a, a wide-body three-engine jet from the 1970s. Again, just to fly charter, uh, mainly out to the States, to Orlando, uh, again, for the Brits to go on holidays. Uh, did an amazing course in Vancouver with Canadian Airlines, which is now part of Air Canada. 
uh, and uh, flew the airplane with the Canadians as well. We did our circuits, um, flying a DC-10 around a place called Moses Lake in northern USA. And at one stage, we were the, were the smallest airplane in the circuit, and a DC-10, with two 747s and a triple seven, also doing circuits with us. And we're in the we we're in the ten, and we're the smallest airplane in the circuit. So that was a, a great experience. Um, back to the UK, flew the DC-10. I flew it for six sectors. The company went broke. So um, uh, you know, I was, I, was, I was back being unemployed again. Uh, very fortunate, Virgin Atlantic were recruiting a couple of months later. I picked up a position with them as a A340 first officer, four engine wide body long haul jet. Wasn't all that popular, but a few of them were sold around the world. Uh, and um, yeah, joined this amazing company and uh, you know, very fortunate. I had 20 years with, uh, with Virgin and had a terrific career with them. Um, and took, you know, we'll talk about it briefly, but the opportunities I took within that company to to do different things. Uh, first officer for two and a half years, and again, the company grew very quickly overnight. I was very fortunate, become a 747 captain uh, in 1999. And uh, you know, flew this amazing old 747 for five years a a around the world. It was an amazing experience, um, including two ex Qantas 747s that Virgin had bought. Um, so it, it was true. Great learning aeroplane. We had a flight engineer on board the aeroplane, and they're generally as old as my grandfather. So it was really interesting dynamic about flying with someone who was decades older than you, um, but working with them. The aeroplanes, because they're old, weren't all that reliable, so we had to work hard to, to make them work. We had some interesting incidents with the aeroplane over those five years, but because of the, the massive redundancy built in, into these aeroplanes and the experience of, of, of my colleagues, we um, were able to sort it out. But a terrific learning experience, you know, and coming off the ethos of, of an A340 to go electromechanical instruments or conventional instruments on a 747 was was um, was interesting. The incidents, I'll maybe talk about them later on, but it, the aeroplane, you know, taught me a lot. Uh, the company uh, sold their 747s. I went back to on the A340 as, as a captain uh, in 2004, flew the A340, generally the 600, which is a stretched version, version of the A340. I flew that for the next six years, including a couple of years I was a training captain, line training captain on 340. Uh, so that opportunity came up, I grabbed it. And uh, you know, again, it was a terrific experience, you know, for instructors in the room, something I hadn't done before. So to become an instructor on the Airbus was a great experience. It was interesting, I'd fly with everyone from uh, captains who'd come off the 747 like me, uh, to brand new first officers had maybe a couple of thousand hours who just joined the company. So interesting and uh, you know, a virgin on the Airbus had a, had a great network. Uh, 2010, the opportunity came up because the global financial crisis, Virgin won pilots off their books uh, to go work for Qatar Airways. So myself and a dozen colleagues from Virgin, we took a three year sabbatical to the Middle East, flew the 777. So it was great to go back on a Boeing. Um, and uh, you know, fly this amazing triple seven based in Doha, and uh, boy, that really opened my eyes as well too. But you know, again, this word perseverance—it was a very different culture, very different operation. And Virgin was very relaxed. You know, um, yeah, it was a nice company to work for. So going and working for another company with new ideas, new procedures was was hard work. So again, this perseverance uh, I had to come in. Three years on the triple seven. And uh, quite an amazing operation. They, they, they flew the world's longest range aeroplane it was at that stage. They'd fly it on 15 minute trips to Bahrain. So absolutely crazy, but that's what they did. So sometimes we'd just do that straight up to Bahrain, but then we'd take it to Houston in Texas, we're 16, 16 and a half hours away. So this amazing uh, difference. And the aeroplane went everywhere, South America, North America, Europe, Asia, subcontinent, and here to Australia. So phenomenal experience. You know, I, I thought I'd seen a fair bit of the world with Virgin. I'd see nothing, absolutely nothing. And uh, um, a great aeroplane, very reliable. Passengers loved it, and you know, as a pilot, loved it as well too. But terrific experience. Uh, went back to Virgin with my colleagues in 2013, back on the Airbus for a couple of months. And then I was fortunate enough to become the Boeing fleet manager on the uh, 747 initially at, at Virgin. So, um, which was, um, I was lucky, you know, I, I, I got this amazing job. And uh, so I, I, I ran the, the 747 fleet. We had 13 747s at that stage, but we're also buying the 787s as well. So we saw the introduction of the 787 as well. So I ended up running the 787 fleet as well and overseeing the introduction on that. 
Um, I did that job for just over three years. The homesickness was getting to me. My wife and kids had been home in Australia for 10 years at that stage. Um, and as much as I love Virgin, it was, it was time to come home. So I picked up a commuting job with China Airlines, which is actually Taiwanese, uh, based up in Taipei. Flew the 747-400 uh, and the 747-400 freighter uh, for China Airlines for 18 months. Finally got a job back here in Australia early this year, flying for a company called Jetgo. Mm -hmm. um, which was, um, which was unfortunately didn't work out. Went and did the Embraer 190 course in uh, St. Louis in um, the States earlier this year. Uh, came home and um, I was going to be the fleet manager on, on, on the E190. Uh, I did a week's work in Brisbane. The following week things weren't looking good and the following week the company went broke. So, um, <laughs> so this word perseverance has come back into the conversation again. Uh, for a couple of months, uh, I've been applying for jobs. I've, I've got a couple turning over at the moment, but, uh, but Jason uh, Patton was kind enough to, to give me a job with Box Hill, and here I am today. So I know I've spoken a long time already, but that's roughly my career, what, what, what I've done uh, over the last 40 years. Just uh, along the way, there, there are opportunities that have come up. So, um, and I was saying to, to one of your colleagues who works with me at Box Hill, uh, Ryan, uh, Fuke, am I pronouncing that properly? Um, is that opportunities come up, and sometimes you got to open the door for that opportunity. And uh, for example, I was a CRM instructor at, at Excalibur Airways in the early 90s, when CRM or human factors is probably more widely known these days was a really new subject, and the industry needed it. The industry were having some real issues with with accidents that are occurring because we weren't doing a great job as pilots or as crew or working together. Um, so it was an exciting time to be a CRM instructor and I was on the Airbus A320 which even in the early 90s was a revolutionary aeroplane. A couple of them had crashed because pilots had misinterpreted information. So we, we uh, did that. I had a near mid-air over Spain 1993, Mr. DC-9 by probably a couple hundred feet laterally. I could still see the co-pilot's head of this DC-9 as he went down the, the side of the aeroplane. He wasn't happy, myself and my captain weren't happy type thing. Um, but uh, I, I wrote to the, uh, we, we put in an air safety report. We'll talk about safety reporting in a sec, but put in an air safety report, but also wrote to the pilot unions saying, how come the Spanish operator could speak Spanish and you know, we're expected to speak English? And the answer was that under ICAO rules that the local operators in their own country could speak their, their own language. So guess what, the French speak French in France um, and the Spanish speak Spanish in Spain and it's, and it's an allowable rule under ICAO. It's, it's, it's a variation. So. Um, the controller made a mistake. He was dealing with a, uh, an emergency with a 747 um, and he got distracted. He made a mistake with the two of us. Um, but I, I wrote to the pilot union and said, you know, this is crazy, blah, blah, blah. And they wrote back and said, oh, well, do you want to come do some voluntary work for us? And stupidly I went, yes, you know, type thing. So I, I joined the, the Belper Technical Committee, not the Industrial Committee, the Technical Committee. Uh, on, we looked at pilot licensing and training. Well, that just opened up an, an, another door. Uh, the uh, the quick story on the side the, the the chairman of the committee was a Concorde training captain and you know at that stage uh, I was a 320 then a 340 first officer but so this amazing guy Concorde training captain he he ran the committee well one of the guys on the committee um, was a human factors a lecturer at uh, one of the universities in the United Kingdom he asked the training captain if he could go on a trip with him to New York on the Concorde I thought geez I should have said that and uh, he did he went on the trip. Uh, the upshot is he flew Concorde. The aeroplane was doing Mark II North Atlantic, 60 odd thousand feet. My, my colleague um, ki kicked out the first officer, but my, my other colleague jumped in the right hand seat. They disconnected the autopilot and he hand flew Concorde, Mark II over the North Atlantic. I'm so jealous, it's unbelievable. But you know, there's an opportunity that, that, that opened up for my colleague and I was just too slow not to take it up myself. But, um, um, but uh, from, from that, uh, I was able then to, to go to pilot union, technical union meetings all around Europe and just the people you meet, the contacts you, you make and the education that you, you get from meeting these people. But hearing from universities and, and from research, um, uh, research part of the industry about what the industry is looking at, what's going wrong, what they're trying to improve is really fascinating. And it just broadens the horizon. And again, it's an option that will be available to you in your career if, if you so choose to do that. 
I did that. That led to some consultancy work with the British CAA, which is the equivalent of CASA here in Australia. So I ended up doing some consultancy work with the CAA, so that opened up another avenue of opportunity. I was still flying, but I was able to do this, this work on the side as well. Um, yeah, and then, uh, you know, I say I was fortunate enough to, um, to become a training captain of Virgin, so I explored that avenue as well. Um, and, uh, and then finally I went and did a Masters of Aviation Management here at Swinburne a few years ago and I did a part-time distance learning and uh, so I picked that up which helped me get the job as, as the fleet manager of Boeing at, at Virgin. So they're all things you can look at during your career. It's not just about flying aeroplanes and, and you know, concentrating on that. Look, if you want to fly aeroplanes, it's sensational. But uh, I'm just a great believer in looking at opportunities that come up during your career and just take them and, and see where they come. And a lot of them are going to be voluntary. You're not going to get paid for it. You're not going to get thanked for it. But it's what you could get out of it as well too and the contacts you make and, and, uh, and go from there. So uh, it's, it's something I've been really determined to do during my career. So, um, so right, in a nutshell, that's, that's my career up to now. As, as I mentioned, I'd like to go back to flying. I'm very keen to go back flying. I've just got to convince someone to give me a job. So, um, um, so that's it. Uh, questions, thoughts at that, this point? Otherwise, I'll continue. Nope, sounds good. I have a question. Mm. Sure. You identify that commercial, uh, you know, the commercial aspects of aviation have really yeah. would have affected your career so far. Mm. What other advice can you give to the pilots just around having that resilience or maybe make a yeah. commercial acumen around that? Yeah. Uh, take out mortgage insurance. Um, yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, yeah, that's a really good uh, question, Jay. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to me coming unemployed this year at my grand old age, I found it really difficult to, to get back in the industry. Um, uh, most of the Australian airlines, and quite rightly so, work on seniority. You know, as a 55 year old, they don't want me in the right hand seat as a first officer or maybe even a second officer. I don't want to do that either, type thing. So, um, uh, yeah, I think maybe by expanding horizons, the fact I went and did a master's, the fact I've got a training ground background, a little bit of a CRM background as well, uh, and you know, I've been fortunate to fly lots of different aeroplanes, hopefully that'll now come into play, you know, and uh, um, but yeah, ag again, I think the more you put on your CV uh, and the more qualifications you can get, the, the better job. And look, it will happen, you know, I've had... I think I've had nine or ten airline jobs. So um, some I've deliberately left, some I haven't. So, um, uh, you know, as I say, if I hadn't lost my job at Anstead, I would have sat there for the next 40 years and, and done that. But guess what? That, that didn't happen. So I think it's really important, as you say, Joe, to, you know, if you've got a, a formal education outside of aviation, you know, sensational. If you want to pick up a formal education within the industry, great, because you might have a medical issue which might ground you for temporary or permanent basis. So, it's important to have as well too. Um, and you know, just just keep those skills going. And the industry, you, you will find, like I found, you know, excuse the pump, but it will go up and down uh, over your, your career cycle. And you know, it's an amazing time at the moment, but you know, hopefully that'll continue on. Long-term projection, Boeing put out a forecast last year, over you know, five, close to 600,000 airline pilots alone in the next 20 years. I mean, it's just unheard of. But guess what, they're not there. They're not even halfway there. You know, it's an amazing time to be going in the industry. But, but getting to there, the industry will do that. It will go up and down. You know, there will be variations during the next 20 years. And you've got to be prepared for that. Again, it gets back to perseverance. You know, if you persevere you know, and hang in there, uh, it, it, it'll pay off. So um, do that. So hopefully, Joe, that's, um, yeah, good, good, good. Um, right, so, yeah, just... Just maybe now to, to touch on really what, what the industry is looking for at the moment and, you know, maybe the skills or the, you know, uh, things you should be looking at doing yourselves uh, as you, you know, embark on your career. Um, as I said, yet again, perseverance is the first thing. Um, grab an opportunity. You know, the, as I say, the opportunities that came up to me, you know, because I had a near mid-air over Spain, I grabbed that opportunity to join a technical committee and, and, and learn what, what they had to do. The AFAP here has got technical committees, so that's an option. You know, especially if you're CPL, um, you know, I'm sure they'd love to have you on board, and you know, for your contribution uh, to be able to put something back in as well. But it's, again, it's interesting who you meet and what you learn uh, f from attending attending these meetings. As I say, you won't get paid, but uh, that's beside the point. Um, it's just interesting. I, I, I was saying before, uh, the the industry is. 
it's changed since I, I, you know, I, I got into the airlines 30, 30 odd years ago. You know, in my time, if you're 28, 29, kind of the, the, the door was closed for you opportunity wise. So it doesn't happen anymore. It can't happen because of age discrimination. But again, because it's a supply and demand industry and there's a, a real shortage of, of, of pilots out there at the moment, uh, you know, just persevere. It doesn't matter if you're 35 or 40. At Virgin Atlantic, before I left, we were taking pilots in the mid 40s, you know, to, and they, they knew basically they're going to be first officers for the rest of their career, but they're quite happy to do it. Um, and, uh, you know, we're able to offer them a career. And the one thing we would say to them is that they could become CRM instructors, they could become in, uh, simulator instructors, they could go into management. And it's interesting, the British Airways do exactly the same thing. You know, they, uh, when it comes to, to those additional skills, it's, it's the person, not the seniority number that, that, that counts. So, you know, if, uh, you know, if you're not as old as me, but you know, if, if you worry if you're not into an airline but 30, I wouldn't be worried about it. Um, it's, uh, there'll be so many opportunities there. It's interesting, a couple of years ago, the Delta, one of the Delta chief parts came and spoke to us of Virgin. Delta owned 49% of Virgin Atlantic, so we had a very good relationship with them. Um, this very senior chief part came and spoke to us, and he was very politically incorrect, but he, he said some really interesting things. And um, uh, he, he said Delta at that stage were taking 80 pilots a month, you know, but he said uh, so were United, so were Southwest, so were Americans. So, you know, phenomenal demand for pilots uh, in the USA at the moment. You've probably seen that the American regional airlines are now advertising here in Australia as well for pilots. Again, that's unheard of. That's, that's just absolutely incredible. So it gives you uh, an idea of, of, of the opportunities that are available in the industry out there at the moment. And it's not just about airlines. You know, I've got mates who fly Flying Doctor and absolutely love it and done it for decades as well too. You know, mates who, who, who continue to be instructors and absolutely love that career choice as well. Uh, you yeah, know, mates are still in regional airlines because it gives them a really good lifestyle. Um, so, you know, it's not just about flying a shiny jet, you know, for Tiger or Virgin or Qantas. Or there's so many different opportunities out there. It's a little like what I did going overseas. And there's even more demand in certain places around the world for, for, for pilots around the world. And again, it doesn't have to be an airline pilot. You know, you could be a regional pilot, you could be a charter pilot, you know, you could be corporate aviation. Um, there's so many opportunities out there. It, it's, 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 um, uh, quite amazing out there. So, there yeah, the opportunities, uh, you know, networking. I'm not into social media, but I understand a lot of this stuff is on social media as well, you know, keeping your contacts going and persevering as well too. The guy who was the chief pilot of Kendall's all those years ago, he finally gave up and gave me a job because I kept on annoying him because I kept on sending him my CV every week type thing. If I was ever here in Melbourne, I'd go knock on his door. I'm not sure that would work these days, but again, it's this perseverance, you know, making sure that the companies know you, that, that you're out there. Um, yeah, professionalism, you know, I mean, obviously it goes without saying, but um, it, it's, it's a requirement, you know, and uh, it doesn't matter where we come from or what our background is or our education or age or, or sex or, or whatever. It's, it's about when you come to work, doing the job, you know, and showing that, you know, showing your colleagues that you're, you're committed to the job and, you know, realise that it is a seven day a week, you know, 365 day a year type job. Um, you know, and I don't know, there's, there's, I, I get a great amount of satisfaction out of trying to do something as well as possible, you know, it's just continuously trying to learn, keep an open mind. I make mistakes, I make mistakes all the time, but learning from the mistakes, writing them down, you know, talking to my mates about it, you know, try, trying to improve, trying to get better, and, you know, and this professional attitude. Plus there's a lot of information available as well too. Um, the industry is trying very hard to break down the silos that every company's got it, its own ideas about how to fly an aeroplane. You know, there's a big push on the industry to standardise uh, how, how aeroplanes are flown and how things are done. So. Um, this professionalism is, is, is so, so important, so um, I'm sure it goes without saying uh, for all of you. Um, yeah, the constant learning is the next thing I've got down. As I mentioned, it's not maybe so much doing formal education, but it is an option. But, uh, you know, if you, if you go into, into the industry, you, you'll do a, an instrument rating check every, every six or 12 months, so you've got no choice. That's your life, you know. Doctors don't do it, lawyers don't do it airline pilots, regional pilots, charter pilots, you know, it's our license. Every six or 12 months, you'll be back in the simulator, back on the aeroplane, renewing uh, that. So guess what? You're gonna get lots of questions. Uh, it's gonna be hard work, it's gonna be stressful, 
yeah, you'll make mistakes. But um, but this is this part of this constant learning, you know, which is, and the learning comes from too from doing different things, you know, for a chance to do when another endorsement comes up, a chance to you know to operate somewhere different or a different base, grab it, you know, if, if if it works for you, and keep keep that learning going. It's just so so important. Um, Lifestyle, yeah, you know, obviously really, really important. And I haven't had a great lifestyle for the last 12 years. I was commuting from overseas back home to Melbourne. Sounds glamorous. It wasn't. It wasn't glamorous at all. You know, I uh, uh, asked my wife. I, I suffered dreadfully from jet lag. Um, there's got to be a balance. And it's really, really important, that, you know, this day, you know, is that, 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 you, that have a lifestyle, but do something, A, that you enjoy, and B, that gives you the, the, the lifestyle, hopefully, as well, too. Look, there's going to be some flexibility required as well too, because as mentioned, it's a every day of the year type job. But, uh, but you know, find that lifestyle. And as I say, you know, I've got mates who fly regional airlines because they love the lifestyle. They're home all the time. You know, uh, it, it gives them that that flexibility. Other mates who fly long haul because they they like going away type thing, and everything in between. So, you know, work. And guess what? It will change during your lives. You know, with kids or mortgages or you know whatever. Uh, the other thing too is that airlines uh, and, and legally they're obliged to do it now. They've got to offer you part time, so you know that that's another option as, as you go through your career. Go part time, or even uh, like myself and a couple of colleagues did when we went to Qatar, take a sabbatical. You know, just you know, go do something different for a couple of years. So look at all that type of thing, and especially if you've got a seniority number in an airline, you want to hang on to that. But you know, maybe grab an opportunity if it comes up. And the, the global financial crisis was a great example. You know, so a whole bunch of us from Virgin took the opportunity to do something different. And I had colleagues who went back into the military, I had colleagues who they went and studied, went and travelled, you know, colleagues who went with me down to Qatar, all these different opportunities. And they will crop up, because as I say, the industry will do that um, as we go along. <laughs> Actually, it's the first thing I should have put down here, got to enjoy it. There's no point doing this if you're not going to enjoy it, you know. Sure, you're going to have some ups and downs, you've got to enjoy it, you know. It's, but it, it is true. It's, it's, I'm sure you all know, you've all got hours in the aeroplane. It's just great fun to get at the end of the runway and push, push the, the, the levers forward and, and, and off you go. You know, sights you'll see, the things you'll do, the places you go. You know, enjoy the experience and take lots of photos, which I'm really guilty of not doing, and, uh, uh, and, and, and do that. Um, yeah, as maybe as I've already mentioned, I've got down here constantly pushing yourself. You know, this desire, this profession to forever learn, forever learn. You know, there's no such thing as a perfect flight and never ever will be. It's always something to, to be learned and uh, uh, that's really important. It keeps it interesting as well too. So, you know, never ever stop learning, never close your mind, never think, oh yeah, I know this type of thing. You know, uh, can continue uh, with, with, the, uh, with the learning. Um, you were know, spoken about volunteering. If you can get onto a committee, you know, do different things, uh, do that as well. Um, you know, and I think basically to sum up this section is, you know, we've all got different ideas, different aspirations, and you know, all got, come from different circumstances. And you know, as I mentioned, there, there's a lot, a lot of choice out there as well. And you know, hopefully you'll you'll come across something that that, that you really like. So, so in summary, that's a bit of an overview about you know wh what I did, what the industry is looking at, and maybe what's required. Uh, you know, for you in your professional career. So, any questions on that at the moment? Right, okay, uh, continue on. Next thing I've got here, um, maybe a bit more about yourself here. First thing I've got is perseverance, yet again. You've got to persevere, you've got to hang in there type thing. Um, have a plan, which, you know, I, I kind of suffered when I was a bit younger. Um, him, as good as my instructor was, he wasn't. He didn't have an airline background. Didn't even have a regional airline background. I, I wasn't quite sure how to do things. You know, how to progress my career, how, what I should do next as my career went along. Um, you know, you've got your senior instructors here. Uh, you've got you know your own instructors, your colleagues. Um, I'm sure you've got friends in the industry. Uh, you know, and you've got the admin staff here to help you as well. Think about what you want to do with your career and make it make a plan. You don't have to stick to it, but have a plan type thing and. As I say, my plan was CPL, IR, um, ATPL subjects. But you know, for yourselves, it might be instructing. You know, it might be uh, uh, doing something else. But have a bit of a plan. Be prepared to, to, to change it. It's a bit like flying in bad weather, isn't it? You've always got to have an alternate, a, a, a different plan. So um, have a plan, and you know, don't be scared to ask people. You know, uh, 
uh, as you go along and uh, change it if necessary to uh, obviously you've got to be a self-starter none of you be here if, if you're not self-starters so yeah this is this motivation thing you've got to keep at it and geez I know what it's like you know I, I really I've done four AT Pels in my career I don't want to do any more you know it's uh, it, it's it's hard work it really is hard work um, but you know, it, motivation's got to come from you. You've got to do the work. And especially as you progress, you know, you're up to CPL subjects, IR subjects, um, it's hard work. A little low the fly. You know, the, the flying's going to be hard work as well too. But um, you've got to have that motivation. You've got, to, got to, you've got to be a bit selfish too about, you know, devoting the time and the energy to achieve it. It's not easy. I'm sure you've all come from classes where maybe 30 or 40 you join the class and by the time you get to CPL level, there might be four or five left. That's normal. That's not what happened in my day. It's happening here. Um, you know, that, it, it's not easy. It really is not easy. But it's worth it once you get there. So um, um, self-starter. Self uh, I spoke about flexibility. You know, just I say have a plan, be flexible, and uh, just see, see what comes up. Uh, grab opportunities, which is kind of flexibility as well. You know, if an opportunity comes up to do something, do endorsement, go somewhere, grab a job. It might not be a great job, but it might be a first job. It might be Northern Territory grab it you know if that works for you do it you know and then very quickly you know that job will lead into another job and you'll go from there type thing as I say I, I relaxed after I got into answer it was my second full-time job I was made I had a job for life guess what that didn't work out you know and uh, so uh, back to square one start again and 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 keep at it just just pursue but I wanted to fly airplanes and it worked out I was lucky you know but I persevered um yeah, leadership, yeah, I mean, it goes without saying, you know, that uh, you know, the captain of an aeroplane, doesn't matter if it's got two people on board or 400 people on board, you've got to run the show. So, you know, leadership is really important. None of us get it right all the time. Be very open-minded, fly with a colleague, you know, him or her might have a different idea to you. You've got to resolve it. And, you know, I had, that, I had that a couple of times in my career where I was outnumbered by the first officer and the flight engineer, but I had to convince them that I was right, you know. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, that, that sometimes takes pers persuasion, but it takes, you know, research and knowledge of the subject as well too. There's nothing like having a manual there to say, look, here it is type thing, this is it type thing. But also you, you can't afford to annoy them as well because you want them for the next eight, nine hours to work with you as well where you get the aeroplane back to where you've come from. So, um, uh, but have that leadership ability, you know, and, and you know, again, if, you know, you're in bad weather and you've got to divert, well, that's a decision, you know, and to have a plan uh, as, as well, you know, not only for your career, but when you fly the aeroplane, I'm sure your instructors pick up on it, but uh, uh, it's something that we, we worked on really hard at Virgin. You know, I, I got the dubious on, I declared it a fuel emergency once in New York because we were low on fuel just because ATC weren't helping us with the show. ATC had forced us into a go-round um, and then were reluctant to bring us back in uh, we knew how much fuel we had, we knew how many minutes there was, uh, we knew we'd been burning additional fuel and they weren't helpful so we, um, we said the magic words and all of a sudden we got some attention, you know, so that, <laughs> that's, that's got to be done, you know. Typical was a line check, I had a check captain watching me which is just typical, you know, so it uh, better happen. Um, so it, it, but if you've already got a plan, you've already talked about the plan, you've briefed about the plan, you're ready when something goes wrong. You're ready if a go round comes around, and you're ready if ATC are not going to do what you want them to do. So um, that you know, do that leadership. Um, spoke about inclusivity. You know, talking to your colleagues, getting along with them. But ultimately, you know, if you're the captain, make the decision. If you're the first officer, you think the captain's wrong, point out to him or her why they are wrong. You know, it works both ways. So uh, do that as well. Got to be honest. You know, it just really comes with the industry. You know, we. Um, you know, we've just got to be honest. And this gets back to what I was saying before. We've got a great history in this industry for over 100 years. We make a mistake, we put our hands up. We don't do punishment in the industry, generally. A um, couple of countries around the world maybe have a different interpreter. It's called just culture. Have you come across that term so far? Yeah, it's, it's really important, you know, is that, um, is that if you make an honest mistake, put your hand up, admit to it. Let, let you know, your colleague know, let your company know. And, the, and then I'll, I'll go into the industry as well. It's trend monitoring. The industry learns from people's mistakes. It's absolutely essential. I'm sure you've all seen that dreadful show, Aircraft Investigators, and, and the safety digests and the safety reports that come out. 
really important as an industry we continue to learn. So just be honest. And if it's an honest mistake, you know, the industry will look after you. It's not to say you won't get away with it, but you know, we, we, we had this inversion. If our crews made a mistake, we'd work with them and we, we'd work out appropriate um, retraining if necessary for the crew and then off they go again. It's really, really important. But the great thing was they told us when they made a mistake. You know, otherwise, a lot of the time we wouldn't have known. And they put their hands up. You know, when you've got senior training captains doing that, that's great. That, that's a really great atmosphere. It's a great culture in the company, but it's absolutely essential. You know, you know, and that applies as much here as it does when you go join an airline or whatever you do. Be honest and report, self-report. It's really, really important in the industry. Um, yeah, last thing I've got in this section was be safe, you know. I mean, it goes without saying, but and we all try to do our best. Um, you know, we all make mistakes, we're all human, we all get tired, we all get jet lagged, um, and we're all, you know, inexperienced in certain areas, you know, and I see that in, you know, colleagues who've got 20,000 hours, more hours than me, uh, as, as much as, as a new student, you know, we all make mistakes, you know, but keep the aeroplane safe, keep yourself safe, you know, get the aeroplane somewhere safe, talk about it, work it out, talk to ATC, talk to the company, do whatever you've got to do if you're up in the air, sort it out, and then uh, you know, get somewhere safe, get the airplane on the ground, and then worry about it after that. So. Right, that's all I've got to say, really. So uh, yeah, so it's open to you now. Questions, ideas, thoughts? Um, I'll go sure, go on. Sure. Um, other than your, other than the Concorde, what's your bucket list aircraft? Oh, the 747. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely love it. Yeah, yeah. I'm a Boeing convert. and I was incredibly fortunate, Joe, to fly the 747. I never thought I did. I'd, I thought I was going to be an Airbus pilot, you know, the shame of it, being an Airbus pilot my whole career. And, um, <laughs> this opportunity came up in Virgin. Um, I could have stayed on the Airbus as a 341st officer, waited a couple of months and become a 340 captain, which would have been amazing, absolutely amazing. Um, but myself and actually one of my mates who lives here in Melbourne as well now, a British guy, we, we had the opportunity a couple months earlier to go on the 747 and oh, I don't know, it's just it's an airplane I've always loved, you know, I've, I've, I've absolutely loved the 747 and uh, um, I couldn't say no, but boy, you know, it was a huge ask to go from a really modern A340, as I say, side stick controls, flying by wire, EFIS uh, um, instrumentation, back to a 747, we, one of our 747s was built in 1970, and this was 1999, so it was 29 years old. It was the 13th 747 ever built, and it was actually a 100 series, which is quite a rare aeroplane even then. Um, yeah, and uh, Virgin had one of those. But electromechanical instruments, um, old aeroplane, uh, hairy old flight engineer in, in, in the side panel. Um, most of the first officers were older than me. But it was this challenge, you know, but also this thing to go, go fly the 747. And it's a fabulous aeroplane to fly. It's probably, no aeroplane's easy to fly. No aeroplane's easy to fly, but it's a really nice aeroplane to fly. It's, it sounds amazing, but it's so well built, so well designed. There's a great book uh, called The 747 by the chief engineer, Joe Sutter, and only died a year or two ago. He wrote a book on it. If you ever get a chance, get it. It's the most amazing story of the 747, but you know, it's more than about that. It's, it's more than that, it goes in, into the Boeing history and uh, and that and and the issues they had with the 747, it was designed and built in just over two years, which is absolutely incredible. And they got it right; it's an amazing aeroplane. And here we are, f we're just on 50 years later, and not as it's still flying, but they're still making the freighter versions. So um, it's it's fairly uh, it's a, it's a great testimony to to what a great design it is, and it's a great aeroplane to fly. So. Um, I'm not sure if I've had my last 747 flight. I, I might well have, but um, I feel very fortunate. I flew it three different times. Once I flew the Classic for Virgin, I then flew the 400 for Virgin about eight, nine, ten years later, and I flew the 400 and the 400 Freighter for China Airlines. So I was very, very fortunate to fly it. So it's 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 a great aeroplane. So yeah, very lucky. And I don't mind Airbuses too. I'm just it's just this huge rivalry between Airbus and Boeing. And, if I had a choice, Boeing, any day, but uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Of course. I just want to ask about um, the requirements for getting into the airlines these days. I notice a lot of airlines advertising pretty low requirements for yep. training first officers, second yep. officers, and stuff yeah. like that. But I don't know how realistic that actually is straight out of school with the profession that's been created um, without actual industry experience. Yeah, it's. It's not impossible. I, you know, I flew with co-pilots in, in China Airlines. Guess how many hours they had? And they were sitting in the right-hand seat of a 747. 
Mm, less. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, well, they did. Yeah, a lot of them learned here at Adelaide. You know, they learned here in Adelaide. They learned in in uh, in the states. So it's quite phenomenal, um, mate. But that's overseas. That's China Airlines, and to be fair, they're their own nationals. But Europe at the moment, you're probably where they they, they do this MPL, multi-pilot license. So, and same thing, 200 hours. Some of them got less than 200 hours. They go in the right-hand seat of uh, an Airbus 320 with EasyJet or 737 with Ryanair. And they're about to go in the right-hand seat of a 330 with Virgin as well. So, it's indicative of what is available in the industry. You know, the industry is supply and demand. It's a business. You know, they, 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 the companies need pilots on their seats. So, um, uh, mate, look, you never know. You know, as I say, the demand for pilots is just phenomenal. It's unheard of. It's absolutely unheard of. Um, the other thing this Delta guy said to us a couple of years ago, the average age in Delta a couple of years ago was 56. Uh, the Americans retire at 65. Um, you know, Virgin Atlantic was only a couple of years younger. BA is about the same. Qantas will be exactly the same. The, the average age of the Qantas pilot being well in their 50s. You know, it's, you know, if you're in your 20s or 30s or 40s at the way, this is an amazing time to get into the airlines, you know, because you know, you'll have this incredible career. Do you know what the retirement age is in Australia for a pilot? Anyone else? There is no retirement age. In a very famous case here in 1991, 91, 92, um, age discrimination. You cannot age dis discriminate in Australia. So there are pilots, captains of jet pilots here in Australia in the mid to late 70s still flying, which is good luck to them, but, you know, but, but they are. You know, and, uh, um, so it's, it, it's uh, and it, quite rightly so. As long as you can hold the license, so hold the medical, hold the instrument rating, why not? You know, if that's what you want to choose. But again, it's indicative of, of the industry also. Obviously, it, it's equal opportunities as well. But um, the rest of the world's got to catch up. New Zealand do it as well. A couple of the Pacific Islands do it as well. But uh, so the problem is that if you're over 65 in Australia, you can only fly in Australia and New Zealand. You can't take a 747, for example, to Hong Kong or LA or whatever because the Americans don't allow it. Um, but you can fly domestically in Australia or Australia and New Zealand and some of the Pacific Islands. So um, again, and the, the rest of the industry, the rest of the world will follow Australia. A, because it's age discrimination, which in most countries is illegal. And B, the demand for pilots is going to be there for years and years to come. Plus, hopefully, hopefully we're all living longer as well. You know, so, uh, uh, and for lots of BA pilots who've had four wives, a lot of them had to work until the, the final <laughs> straw as well. Too. But, you know, that, that's, that's a slide. Um, so, mate, look, what I'd say is get your qualifications, get the CPL, ATBL subjects, or frozen ATBL, and the instrument rating, and, and you know, just keep at them. You, know, you, you, meet their, you meet their theoretical requirements. You've got their requirements. Keep at them, you know. But in the meantime, obviously, you know, get a charter job or a regional airline job or dropping parachutes, whatever. Do that as well, you know, keep at it type thing. And anything else to make yourself employable. Um, lots of airlines these days use psychometric testing, which is, which is interesting. It's been around the industry a long time. I'm not a big fan of it. I don't, I don't think it works all the time. And uh, I'm not sure if it's better or worse than other systems, but they do work on psychometric testing. But at the end of the day, if you've got the qualifications, got the experience, got a, a good um, reference from previous or current employer, it all helps, you know, it all helps. So, uh, um, but yeah, mate, as I say, if you've got the qualifications, yeah, and it's, uh, it's, it's going to be the way for a long time to come. It's amazing at the moment, all four airlines in Australia are advertising, Tiger, Virgin. Uh, Jetstar and Qantas are all after pilot. I've never seen that before. It's just unheard of as well, too. So, incredible opportunity. Little old Rex are always short of pilots. You know, you look at Cobham and uh, Alliance, and they're always after pilots as well. You know, just it's it's phenomenal in industry what what's out there. But if you're qualified, you're in the running. So, yeah, keep at it. Mm. Yeah. What I'm trying to understand is, a, yeah, a lot of young people are doing the industry, which yeah. heightens the need for experience in the company to in order to share that yes. culture. So I can't, how, I'm trying to understand how a man like you is struggling to find a job. I mean, seniority. I mean, if I join Qantas, or if Qantas would have me, it's probably closer to the point. I'd have to start as a second officer, or maybe a first officer on the 737. 
mate, they wouldn't want me to do that, and I don't want to do that. Yeah. You know, so it, it's it's self-inflicted. You know, same with Tiger, same with Jetstar, and same with Virgin. I mean, Jetstar and Qantas are the same seniority list. I understand. So is Virgin and Tiger. So I'd, I'd have to start at the bottom. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. You know, I know pilots have come home and chosen to do that. I don't want to do that. You know, I, I think. Yeah, you know, a great believer in doing different things in the industry. I'm really enjoying the work at Box Hill at the moment. I'm writing the instrument rating course, which is, which is hard work, you know, type thing. But, but I, I enjoy. I'm really enjoying that, you know. And um, I have got applications in, and there's one that's reasonably well advanced with an overseas airline at the moment. They should have told me last week if I've been successful or not. They haven't, so I don't know. I look, and I'll, I'll wait until they get back to me. Hopefully in the next week or so, and make a decision from there. But. Um, yeah, it's it, it's hard. Uh, I can't work for the Chinese airlines. They have to be 54, 55. Mm. Unfortunately, I'm very, very close to 56, so that, that avenue is closed. I've worked in the Middle East. I'm not in a great hurry to go back there and do that again. Um, nor nor the UK, Europe, even though I've got a European license, ATPL. I've got a well, British passport, I should say, as of March next year, not a European passport. But um, the same thing, I'm back on, on this commuting. You know, my, my wife and kids live here, so um, I spent 28 years overseas. I feel as though I've, I've, I've done it, you know, type thing. And, um, but, um, so whether I'll, I'll get the opportunity or not, and look, it's me being picky, you know, and uh, um, uh, I'm not sure. We'll see. We'll see, mate. You know, I'll see what happens in the next week or so and make a decision from there. So, but yeah, I'd, I'd like to finish my career of my choice, not a company going broke. You know, I, I wasn't impressed with Jetco. Get over to here. You know, there you go. These things happen. It's happened before. It happened with Excalibur. It happened with Air Lingus. You know, you know to be honest, in, in this room, it'll happen to a few of you in this room as well too. So um, yeah, just be prepared for it as much as you can, and be qualified and be flexible about your next job. You know, and to be honest, the younger you are, the, the better your chances. You know, it, I very quickly had a job after Excalibur went broke. Myself and my mates, were, we were 320 rated. Um, we could do a CCQ course, cross crew qualification course from the 320 to the 340. That suited Virgin because it was, it was very cheap and training up someone out of the military who they'd have to do all the Airbus training with. For my colleagues and I had 320 experience, it was a very short course. So, um, yeah, so um, that's, that's economic reality. And we were prepared to go back and be first officers again even though we had been captains in Excalibur. Um, you know, we were, again, we'll, that flexibility, we're happy to go back and start again. You know, for my colleagues and I joined at that time, you know, within two and a half years, we were captains again in Virgin. So that's dumb luck, you know, that's just dumb luck. So, yeah, so, um, but yeah, that's flexibility. Yeah. And maybe I'm not being flexible at the moment, so. Mm. Uh, of course. Yeah, uh, when you um, worked overseas, was there any flexibility with the carriers, just with regards to family, obviously, who are working away? No. Do they allow you to, you know, bring your family over? Oh, education, yeah, like um, yeah, look, Qatar, we're, we're fine about that. They preferred for the families to, to move to, to, uh, to you know, Qatar in that example. Um, I chose to, my wife had only brought the kids, my three kids home a couple of years earlier, so they were already settled in in life here in Melbourne. The oldest two were at secondary school. We didn't want to drag them out of secondary school to go to the Middle East. So that was our choosing again. We, we chose not to be flexible about that. Um, I, was, I was lucky enough to fly the 777 for Qatar. The aeroplane came here to Melbourne. So when I did get overnight here, I had 48 hours off. So I could go home and cut the grass and wash the car, go back to work. Um, so th that, that was available. And because they flew here daily, uh, if I had days off or leave, you know, 12 hours later, I could be back at home. So, but that was my choice, you know, to, to leave the family here. Um, but uh, look, the airlines are flexible. If you've got a very young family, excuse me, or families, kids not at school, um, yeah, why not take them to the Middle East or to, to the Far East or Europe or whatever? You know, my three kids were all born in the United Kingdom and they're quasi Aussies, you know, so, uh, you know, they had this amazing experience over there and, you know, they've got the passport. Um, so they know a fair bit about the UK and obviously a fair bit about Australia. So, you know, amazing opportunity. And you know, my idea of Europe 30 years ago was to do a Kentucky trip for three weeks. You know, that was my idea of Europe. So 28 years later, I came home. So uh, <laughs> again, it's, um, it, you know, these opportunities sometimes present themselves. So, yeah. And when you Overseas, 
sort of stumbled upon them by chance or have you applied through an application? Yeah, I've, I've, I've gone through applications. The, the company I'm applying for at the moment, um, yeah, it's an application process and it, it's drawn out. I, I applied in July. Here we are in December and it's ongoing, you know. So I went up there for an interview five, six weeks ago. I did four days of interviews. I mean, it was just absolutely amazing. You know, we interviewed uh, two B co pilots in Virgin and spent 45 minutes with them. You know, it's just the, the extreme differences from, from one airline to the other. Um, when I went to China Airlines again, that was I think that was a four-day interview process as well. The medicals are the big thing. The, um, uh, the Asian carriers have really strict medicals, uh, and generally they go for two days. So they're really onerous medicals, but that's just the way they do it. And they're based on, the, on their military medicals, so um, yeah, they're, they're, they're tough. But you know, there's also a simulator session, there's also psychometric testing, there's also interviews. So the whole process is, is fair, fairly long. So. Whereas in, in Australia, you know, the United Kingdom, you might do a simulator and you'll do an interview. And that's it, because A, you got the license, B, you got the medical, um, and uh, you know, you're effectively a local, so. But it, it does vary. Look, it's a great opportunity. It's amazing. The flying I was able to do with China Airlines in Qatar was absolutely fabulous. Uh, it, was, it was incredible, really, and um, very, very fortunate to do that. And, uh, and that, that was an opportunity, you know. Um, um, so, yeah, look I, I, look, I applied for it, you know, and I, I, I chose to go for it and put myself through the agony of going through the interview process. But also, you join, you've got to do the ATPL, which to be fair, sometimes is abbreviated because I had a European ATPL or an Australian ATPL. But then you've got to do their typewriting course. I, you know, I had thousands of hours in the 747. I had to do the whole 747 course again at China Airlines. So that was hard work, you know. You have to learn their way, not the Boeing way that we were using at Virgin or, you know, whatever other company I worked for. So um, it's hard work. And times I, I used to think, what am I doing? But, you know, but, you know, persevered and, yeah, worked out okay. So, yeah. Do you find the conditions, I guess, um, sort of in Australia are very safe and conscious? And yes. Done, you know, the right way, but yes. sort of, I guess, maybe in the Middle East or some parts of Asia, might yeah. be that way. Uh, yeah, look, I, I've had incidents everywhere. <laughs> you know, maybe it's me, um, but uh, yeah, incidents do happen. You know, it, 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 it's it's how the company and the country deals with the incidents is a really important thing. And you're right. You know, countries like Australia, the USA, United Kingdom, Europe have a, a terrific um, history and continue and, and continues of reporting, self-reporting. Or something before something goes wrong, you know, mechanically, ATC wise, or yourself, we report it and. Yeah, and these countries get ranked in Australia, and UK, USA, etc., right in the very top tier of doing it, which is true. Um, yeah, some of the other countries and companies maybe aren't as good, you know. And uh, uh, yeah, for whatever reason, is it, is it a cultural issue? I'm not sure. And the culture might be the company culture, or it might be the country culture, or it might be a bit of both as well too. And um, uh, yeah, so um, I'm trying to be. Um, trying to answer your question. Um, look, anything can go wrong. As, you know, there are unfortunately carriers in the Western world that make mistakes, like there are carriers from around the world. So, uh, um, and again, it's what I was saying before about being safe in yourself. You keep the aeroplane, keep yourself safe, keep the aeroplane safe, you know, and then sort it out afterwards type thing. But uh, yeah, most companies these days, I'm certainly aware of, have a just culture, you know, put your hand up admit your mistake. The problem is these days you can't get away with it anymore because everything's recorded. You know, the aeroplane's got these amazing uh, flight data recorders and cockpit voice recorders. So there's no point hiding something. They know, you know. And, uh, when I was at Virgin, I worked very closely with the safety department. But the safety department would know very quickly if, an, if a, a parameter had been exceeded on the aeroplane. And you know, we were then hopeful that the crew would actually write to us and say the same as well. Most of the time they did. So it, it was great. And we could resolve it from there. So, um, yeah. So, um, but look, it, it's in a, it's in a, um, a company's interest to be safe. You know, it's not a great business model. You know, uh, if if they're having incidents, so, uh, um, and there are certain companies around the world that have engaged companies like Flight Safety Foundation or, or Flight Safety Academy in the USA to come and work with them because they're, they're having they're having issues with with the culture of the company or how the airplanes operated. So, and uh, you know, which again is very proactive. So, it's very important. So. But um, yeah, certain places in the world I wouldn't fly. But um, yeah, here, yeah. but uh, yes. 
Yeah. yeah. Very good. Uh, no, no, thankfully um, there wasn't a huge amount of difference. I was just trying to cast my mind back uh, 10 years to when I did them here in Australia. There was a lot of similarity because the Australian system originally was based on the British system and then sometime in the 50s they obviously split away from uh, the UK CAA um, to, to set up their own system here. So there was some similarity there. Uh, not a lot but some, so that, that kind of helped me. So. And again, I was just so determined to give up my pub job and go flying. I wanted that license. So, um, but you know, I was, I was very fortunate. I, I found a very good TAFE college in London to go to, where they taught the subjects and and just just worked hard for those few months to, to convert the license and and did it. So, yeah, a lot of similarity. The job I did for the CAA consultancy a few years later, um, I looked at the initial European Question Bank. I looked at five thousand European. ATPL theory questions. So I saw all those in their infancy, but again, that's 20 years ago. So, and slightly different because every country was asked to contribute to a certain subject. And for example, the French did navigation. So all of a sudden, all the French navigation questions from ATPL level were put into the European Question Bank, and they were quite different to the United Kingdom one. You know, I, the Italians might have done meteorology. The French, oh sorry, you know, the Germans might have done aircraft performance, whatever it was. So. There was a big change at the European level, but um, yeah, it, generally um, the industry very quickly finds out what's in the questions and uh, and goes from there. But it's not just the questions. I'm a great believer if you learn the subject, you should know the you should know the answer to the question. I'm not a believer in learning the answers because there, there's no great learning in that at all, and it shows up. It's interesting you fly with people who've learned have learned the answers and not learned the subject, and even at airline level, you'll you'll see that. So. Um, yeah, learn the subject, and uh, hopefully the answers will come to you. So, uh, man, it's a good question. Because I was the first officer here, I had very few command hours. Um, I had to do the whole lot of game. What they did, they assessed my logbook, assessed my strain ATPL, and went, "No, you got to do the lot." So, um, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, if, if I'd been now, now, you know, thousands of hours and command hours, it would have been a lot simpler. But no, you know, I had. I think it maybe had three, three thousand hours by that stage, maybe three and a half thousand. Not a lot. Um, so yeah, I pretty well did everything again. So yeah, it was great fun. Yeah, not. <laughs> anyway, again, I chose to do it. You know, that 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 was something I, I chose to do. So yeah. Very good. All right. No other questions. Oh, good. All right. Oh well, well. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rodney. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Absolutely. Now, I've got a round of applause for for coming in. Oh, it's a pleasure. Absolutely pleasure. So, um, I, I work down at Box Hill, and Joe's got my email address. Um, you know, just feel free to you know write me a letter, email, whatever, and we'll come and see me. You know, I'm more than happy to you know have a chat to you, one to one basis, or exchange emails with you and then I can help you with you know as you make your progression uh, through the career and you know I'm, I'm there at Box Hill so yeah don't, don't hesitate um, yeah thank you very much and good luck with it all uh, yeah, I hope it goes well enjoy it as well it's great fun it's great fun yeah.